Hey everyone, so I just wanted to make another short video uh, going over some more problems involving uh, solving systems of equations using the substitution method. And so here uh, I've got the, the page we, we ended at last in the last video where we described uh, what the approach was for solving, or what the procedure was for solving a system of equations using the substitution method. And so, right, you know, what we did was we, you know, if we were given multiple equations, and, you know, we'll typically encounter only two equations, uh, the idea was to, to isolate one variable in one of the equations, and, and once you've isolated that variable, uh, well, on the other side of the equation, you'll have an expression for that isolated variable. And so the idea is, is now that you have an expression for that that's equivalent to the variable, you can plug that expression in to wherever you see the variable in your other equation. Right, you substitute this new expression for the isolated variable into the other equation. And, and when you do that, your other equation will no longer have two variables. It'll only be an equation in one variable. And so an equation in one variable is, is one that we can solve. A linear equation in one variable is one that we can solve. And so we can uh, solve that equation and find a value for one of the variables. And then we can plug that value for that variable back into one of our, our original equations and find the other uh, value of the other variable. And so, you know, saying that abstractly or saying the procedure and the steps uh, might not sound so clear um, without an example. So let's, let's just work through a few more examples and, and uh, re-familiarize re -familiarize ourselves with this process of substitution. And, and again, let me encourage you to, to practice or to try these problems on your own first and then uh, by, by pausing the video and then we can go over them together afterwards. Uh, and, and if you haven't already tried these problems out on the activity, uh, I would encourage you to do so. I think there are a lot of uh, worthwhile problems to do there. It just offers a lot of extra practice. Okay, so let's suppose that we've got the system that we wanted to solve. Uh, that system was 5y is equal to 2 minus x. And then in our other equation, we've got x plus 3y is equal to 11. And we want to find the point, the x value and the y value together that make both of these equations true at the same time. And there may be more than one. Uh, for for linear, two linear equations, usually there's only one. Right? We saw uh, pictorially what this looked like, what solving system of equations looked like. Uh, so if we want to solve the system of equations by substitution, we want to isolate one of the variables. We want to look for a variable that's easy to get alone. And here I see two candidates. I see this, this negative x. You know, if I kind of shuffle things around, add x to both sides, subtract 5y from both sides, I would get x alone. Uh, another thing I can do is I could get this x alone. Right? We just want to isolate one variable in one of the equations. It doesn't matter which one. Uh, so maybe let's just isolate this bottom example. Let's subtract away 3y from both sides. And we get that this, this equation too, it's equivalent to the equation x is equal to 11 minus 3y. Okay, and so this, this, this idea of substitution is that, that we have for this x variable we know that it's equivalent to 11 minus 3y if we're going to make both equations true. If we're going to find a point that makes both equations true, the x value of that, that point, it's 11 minus 3 times its y value. And so let me go in the other equation and replace this x with 11 minus 3y, where we said x ought to be from our other equation. And so this gives us 5y is equal to 2 minus 
x, but we said x was 11 minus 3y from our isolated x in the other equation. Okay. And so here, when we solve this equation for y to see the y value of our point, um, we get 5y is equal to 2. Then we'd have to distribute out this negative, right? Subtracting this group means subtracting 11, subtracting negative 3y, and so we get minus 11 plus 3y. And so if I subtract 3y from both sides, we get 2y on the left, no more y's on the right, and then 2 minus 11. If I have $2 and I owe $11, I can pay off some of that, but I still owe 9. I still owe $9. And so then we divide both sides by 2. And we get y is equal to negative 9 over 2. Doesn't feel very ideal, but that's, that's just what it is. That's what the, the y value of this point of intersection is. And so, uh, you know, when we solve a system of equations, we're finding, uh, if we think graphically, we're finding uh, where our two lines or our two graphs intersect. And it's not always going to be guaranteed that they intersect at a nice, very happy, clean point. In fact, most of the time, they probably won't, unless we create a nice problem that, that does so. Okay, so, so we're not done here because we're looking for the point of intersection between these two, two lines, and we only know the y value of this point. And so to get the x value of this point, well, we take this y value and we plug it back into the equation, because these equations relate x to y. And so it doesn't matter which equation we use. Let me use, uh, let's use the first, or the, sorry, the second one, because we know uh, x is, you know, easier to get in the second one uh, slightly. We have an equ equation set up to get x. So we know x plus 3 times y. And nine, or y is negative 9 over 2. Is equal to 11. And so x plus, and then what's 3 times negative 9 over 2? Again, uh, I can think of uh, multiplying by a fraction as, well, multiplying the numerator and dividing the denominator, and, and multiplying 3 with negative 9 gives us negative 27, and we'd still have to divide the 2. Another way you can see this is you can express 3 as 3 over 1, multiply with the negative 9 over 2. Uh, we just multiply the numerators, multiply the denominators, we get the same result. And then also another thing I should say, and we've, we've mentioned this before, is that uh, a negative number, we can interpret uh, that also as, you know, if we see this as a fraction, we can interpret the, either the numerator being negative or the denominator being negative, but, but not both. Right? I can put that negative sign in the numerator and the denominator, uh, either way is fine. <coughs> Okay, so we've got negative 27 over 2 is equal to 11. And, and if I want to undo this, this negative 27 over 2 that's being added, you know, I could subtract that away or, you know, maybe a little more clearly I can add 27 over 2 to both sides to undo essentially the difference, the subtraction by 27 over 2. So here, uh, 11 plus 27 over 2, well this is equal to, 11 is the same thing as 22 divided by 2. And so adding that with 27 over 2, well that just amounts to adding the numerators and keeping the denominator the same, giving us 49 over 2. Okay, so let's put this together. 
so we found the x value, we found the y value for this point. So let me just write that the solution to the system of equations is 49 over 2, the x value, comma, negative 9 over 2, the y value. Okay. Uh, let's let's do a few more here. Let me put up just let me put up two equations, two systems of equations, and ask you to to try and solve these systems. So uh, solve the systems y is equal to three x minus five and six x minus two y is equal to ten. And then solve the other system, y is equal to 3x plus 2, y is equal to 3x plus 4. So pause the video and give, give these two examples a try. And they're, they're a little bit different than the examples that we've, we've done so far. Okay, so going through this first system of equations, I actually see that you know, this, this first in this first equation, we've got a variable isolated already, right? This y variable is isolated, and it, we see that y ought to be the same as 3x minus 5. And so in the next equation, when I see that y variable, I can replace it with what y is equal to, 3x minus 5. And so this is telling us that that's 6x minus 2 times y, or in other words, 3x minus 5, what y is equal to, this ought to be the same as 10. So we distribute that negative 2, and we get 6x minus 6x plus 10, is equal to 10. Something feels funny already, but let's keep going. All right, so 6x minus 6x, that's, that's 0. And so we're just left with 10 is equal to 10. So what does this tell us? We try to solve the system of equations. We tried to figure out what number for x Right, we're, we've got an equation for x here, and that, that number we get for x is going to tell us uh, the point, the x value of the point of intersection. And we, we kept going, and we got to a statement that was just true, just, just fundamentally true, didn't even care about x. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that actually any x value works, no matter what x value I, I try to plug in into this original or into this equation up here. Uh, we actually get something. We get an equation that's just true for any value of x. <coughs> for all values of x. And so what's that telling us? That, that's telling us that every single x value, every single number that you can possibly let be, let x be, uh, that corresponds to a solution to the system of equations. In other words, uh, really this is telling us that you know, the fact that we get this true statement here, regardless of x, tells us that there are infinitely many solutions. So let's make a little bit more sense of this. Right, we, we talked about graphically what it meant to solve a system of equations, and it meant finding the points of intersection between the graphs of your equations. Right, if there are infinitely many solutions between these two linear equations, that means that their lines intersect infinitely many times. And so that's telling us that these two lines, well, the only way that can be true is, is if they're actually the same line. They're just, these two equations are describing the same line. 
And let's double check that. Let's verify. You know, we, we have this algebra telling us we've got two of the same lines, but let's let's really convince ourselves that these are tr that's truly the case. So let's check. That the two lines are the same. You know, this is the first example we've encountered like this, and I just want to make sure it's very feels very convincing and understandable. Um, so here, if, if I take 6x minus 2y is equal to 10, and I put this in slope-intercept form, <coughs> in other words, we isolate y, get y by itself, then what we're saying is that we should expect to see the same equation as what we got above. And that'll really tell us that we're dealing with the same line from these two equations. And so here, if we take away 6x from both sides, we get negative 2y is equal to negative 6x plus 10. And then dividing both sides by negative 2, what's well, going to change the signs of both of my, my terms there and divide by 2 for both of my terms. And we get uh, 3x minus and that's what we that's what we said we would we would get and so these two lines are truly the same and so so let's say uh, let's say this is my my green line and above is my light blue line and if I were to graph these well the blue one has a y-intercept of 0 comma negative 5 and a slope of positive 3 over 1 and the light green line has, has the same graph. And if solutions to the system of equations are where our lines intersect, then of course there's infinitely many points because they intersect at every single possible point on this line containing infinitely many points. Okay, so that's, so that's one example of solving a system of equations and getting infinitely many solutions here. Uh, you know, I know you're not telling me what the, the solutions are, but, but it's enough to just tell me that there are infinitely many and that any point I look, on, at, look at on this line will, will be a solution to the system. Okay, let's, let's look at this example now. So y is equal to 3x plus 2 and y is equal to 3x plus 4. So you might be able to reason through just looking at these two equations that actually there won't be any solutions. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But what if we what if we solve this system of equations? Let's say again, uh, maybe I call this line one, and this one line two. And and we know we know in the second equation, well, we can do this either way. It's kind of symmetric. But this y variable here is isolated in my second equation, and so y. It's equivalent to the expression three x plus four. And so I can take that expression three x plus four and substitute it in for this y variable in my other equation. All right, so, so y ought to be the same as 3x plus 4 in my first equation. And that's equal to 3x plus 2. All right, so here all I've done is I've taken my first equation and I've replaced the y with 3x plus 4. Okay, now trying to solve this equation for x, one thing I can do is I can, I can subtract away 3x from both sides. You know, I, can, I would want to try and get all my x variables on one side. And so I'd subtract this 3x on the left to get it over on the right. But when we do that, 3x take away 3x is zero sets of x's, and we're just left with 4 is equal to 2. Right, and so... In the previous problem, when we saw, or when we used substitution and we tried to solve our resulting equation, we got an, an, a statement. We arrived at a statement that was just fundamentally true, regardless of the value of x or regardless of the value of y. And so this told us that every single point on our lines resulted in a solution to the system. It didn't matter what value of x we were looking at; that will lead to a solution to the system. But here we get something, we get a, 
after substituting it and trying to solve our resulting equation, we get a statement that's fundamentally false, right? Four is just not equal to two. It's never true, regardless of the value of x. Right, so if I looked at this, origin, this, this equation up here, and I plugged in some value of x, what we're saying is that this will never be true. If I multiply 3 with some number, add 4, it's never going to be equal to 3 times that same number plus 2. This is never true. There's no such, such x values that do the job here. And so what this is telling us is that there, there's no there's no solutions to the system of equations. And so the idea here is that if we try and solve our system of equations and we end up at an equation that's just fundamentally untrue, four is not equal to two then we've got no solutions to the equation. In other words, no solution to the system of equations. And in our example on the left, if we, if we solve our system of equations and we arrive at something that's fundamentally true, just true regardless of x, we've got infinitely many solutions. And so the picture here is that one line has a slope of three and a y-intercept of four of two. So it looks something like this. And then the other line has the same slope, slope of three, but a y-intercept of positive four. And so it might look something like this. And we see that these two lines just don't over overlap ever. They're parallel. And so there's no place where they, they intersect. There's no solution to the system. And we can see this actually right away from our equations from our two equations here, because they both have the same slope and different y-intercepts. They, they correspond to different lines, different parallel lines. But it's not always going to be the case that you're given two equations in, in slope-intercept form that you can interpret the graphs very uh, immediately. Um, sometimes you might be given two equations that, that look different, um, look very different, and then end up being parallel. But this is how you would see that using substitution. Okay, uh, let's do let's do one more problem, and, and we'll be doing some applications of solving system of equations. Systems of equations is probably one of the more applicable ideas in this class, um, and and this is sort of just uh, uh, getting a little bit of that in advance. Okay, so here I've got this, this situation that says that the only coins Jeremiah has are dimes and quarters. And his coins have a total value of $5.80. Um, so if he has a total of 40 coins, how, how many of each type of coin does he have? So this feels like, you know, you look at this problem and it just kind of numbs your brain a little bit. It's how do you even go about addressing this question? And so, uh, you know, we, we've just learned about solving systems of equations and substitution. Let's see if we can set up a system of equations and solve it. And so most of the time when we've set up equations, we've kind of had uh, slope-intercept form in mind, and we've tried to find some sort of slope and some sort of y-intercept, but, but that doesn't really work here so well. Um, and really, we just need to come up with two equations that are just true statements about this problem. Uh, but, but to come, even come up with equations, we, we really ought to come up with the variables that belong in our equations. And so what are two quantities that vary or are unknown? Um, well, here maybe let me, let's really look at this, this last statement. We're saying how many of each type of coin does he have? In other words, we don't know uh, 
uh, the number of dimes Jeremiah has and the number of quarters. So let me call uh, this, this, this quantity the number of dimes, let me call it D. And then let me call uh, this number of quarters Q. And so I know in the past when we've set up equations, I've had on this idea of, of dependent and independent variables, and I've typically used the color blue for independent and green for dependent. Um, but sometimes, sometimes in equations, there really isn't uh, a variable that's dependent and another that's independent. Sometimes um, you can't really pick one out. And so the colors here aren't really to emphasize any extra point, um, just to really emphasize that we've got two separate quantities, two separate variables here. Okay, so here we, we've got two statements about the dimes and the quarters. Um, so we've got one statement here, maybe I'll highlight it in uh, light green, it says his coins have a total value of $5.80. And the other statement is that uh, he has a total of 40 coins. And so I would encourage you to pause the video here if, if you want to you know, take a moment to really make sense of this problem. But see if you could come up with one equation for this, this statement in light green and one equation for this statement in light blue using our variables d and q. So yeah, pause the video, give it a try for a second, um, but, but we'll, get, we'll get started on this in just a moment. So I think the easier equation to, to make sense of here comes from this light blue statement. He has a total of 40 coins. Right, so, so if D represents the number of dimes this person has, this person Jeremiah, and Q represents the number of quarters, right, maybe it, it would be a little clear if I read, wrote the total number of dimes and the total number of quarters, Well, it is true that the, the number of dimes, if we added up that number with the number of quarters, well, what do we expect to get? Well, if, if he has 40 coins, then, then this better equal 40. Assuming, you know, we're not trying to be tricky here and he has more than just dimes and quarters. Um, so if he has you know, some number of dimes, some number of quarters, if you pull that all together, that better be 40 coins. But, but D represents exactly this idea here, the number of dimes. And Q represents this idea, the number of quarters. And so here we have an equation that D plus Q is equal to 40 from this statement in, in blue, in light blue. Okay, what about, what about the statement in light green? So his coins have a total value of $5.80. So this one's a little bit more challenging to, to make sense of, but, but let, let me, you know, let me just tell you one way that might be nice to think of this is, is you know, let's, let's forget about this problem for a moment. Suppose I had five quarters. If I had five quarters, how much money would you tell me I had? Well, five quarters would be the same as or maybe I should say the value of five quarters is, well, each quarter is 25 cents, right? So 0 0.25, and we would multiply that with five, right? 
5 times 0 0.25, they're just adding up 0 0.25 five times. And this would be $1.25. What about if I had uh, 12 quarters? Well, then we would just take the value of each quarter and multiply that by 12. And we would get $3, right? 12 times 0 0.25 is, is 3. And that's really just saying that uh, 12 sets of the 25 cents is $3. And in general, if we have, uh, if we want to figure out the, the, how much money he has in terms of quarters, we would just take you know, the, the worth of each quarter and multiply it by the number of quarters. And so this idea is really useful. And maybe I should write that down too. So uh, to find the amount of money Jeremiah has. And I'm just thinking in terms of quarters for a second for the sake of simplicity. So to find the amount of money Jeremiah has in terms of quarters, well you take the, the value of the quarter, 25 cents, and you multiply it with the number of quarters. And this is how the amount of money he has in quarters. Okay, so hopefully this isn't getting getting too confusing, but but this this above statement says that he his coins have a total value of five dollars and eighty cents. And so another equation we can write here is that uh, if we add up, so the total amount of money, the total dollars Jeremiah has in dimes, right? Jeremiah has some amount of dimes, some amount of quarters. If we add up the, the value of those dimes with the value of those quarters, What are we going to get here? Well, it's going to be the total amount of money Jeremiah has. Okay, well, the total amount Jeremiah has is $5.80. And what's the total amount in quarters that he has? Well, I know it's 0 0.25 times what, however many quarters he has. And we don't know how many quarters he has, but we have a variable that we can use to represent that. We're using Q here to represent the total, the number of quarters Jeremiah has. And we can use this idea with, with the dimes, right? The amount of money that Jeremiah would have in terms of dimes would just be well, the worth of each dime times the number of dimes Jeremiah has. In other words, 0 0.10 times the number of dimes Jeremiah has. We don't know it, but we do know that we've been using D to represent that number. All right, so we have this equation here. I'm gonna call it equation one. And we have another equation from above, equation two, which we said was uh, the number of dimes plus the number of quarters is equal to, well, he has 40 quarters in general. And so now we just need to, to solve the system. And how can we solve this system? Well, we've we can use substitution. We can get one of these variables alone in one of these equations and then plug it, that expression for that isolated variable into the other equation. Um, let me isolate D. We can do either D or Q, um, but I think in this, 
we want to use the second equation for sure. Um, and, and, and it doesn't matter which variable we use. Um, let, me, let me isolate D here. So D is the same as 40 minus Q if we take away Q from both sides of the second equation. And so if we take this expression for D and plug it in for the D we see in this other variable, then we arrive at the equation 0 0.10 times D, which we are saying is 40 minus Q. Well, this is the same as, or I still need to add 25, 0.25q. Now this is the same as $5.80. Okay, so let's let's distribute this 0.10. And so uh, 0 0.10 times 40, I believe that's 4 minus 0.10q plus 0.25q is equal to 580. I'm going to take away 4 from both sides. And then also notice that combining minus 0.10q with 0.25q, uh, that's the same as 0.15q, right? And then 580 take away 4 is 180. And the next thing we need to do is to get Q alone is to divide by 0 0.15. And so you can use a calculator to compute this. Um, I know that 0 0.15, I know 30 cents goes into a dollar 80 six times. And 15 cents is half of that, so it should take twice as much. So, uh, this would require uh, 12 quarters. Right, 30 cents goes into a dollar 86 times, so 15 cents goes into a dollar 80 uh, 12 times. Q is equal to 12. And so, if Q is equal to 12, the number of quarters Jeremiah has is 12. What's the number of dimes Jeremiah has? Well, we can just take this Q and plug it back into either one of our equations. Um, and we can use this second equation here and, and just our intuition to realize that you know, the number of coins ought to add up to 40 coins. And so Q plus D should be 40. And so if Jeremiah has 12 quarters, then he only has enough room to have 28 dimes. So the, the punchline here, whenever we do a problem like this, you know, we want to make a conclusion here. This is really telling us that Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah has 12 quarters and 28 dimes. Okay, so let's let's just quickly check in our mind that this makes sense. So we know that 12 plus 28, that's 40 coins in total. But let's let's really double check that this is, uh, this gives us $5.80. And so notice here that this is 12 quarters. Well, we said that earlier, that, that's $3 here. Right, if four quarters is a dollar, then 12 quarters is $3. And then dimes, 28 dimes, well, 10 dimes is a dollar. And so we've got, well, a dollar, we got a two, we got two dollars, two dollars and 80 cents. And so putting those together gives us the 580. This, this checks out. Okay. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to introduce one of those problems just to get it in our mind as well. Um, we'll talk about in the next video another approach to solving systems of equations uh, called, or not substitution, we just learned substitution, uh, called elimination. 
And, and substitution tends to be a friendlier uh, approach, but, but there are some times where elimination might be uh, more ideal to use. And then after that, we'll talk about applying these ideas to, to problems a lot like this one here. And we'll, we'll talk about some technique and overall structure to, to make those problems simpler to deal with. Okay, so, so that's all for this video. Uh, I'll see you in the next one.